Thank you, Josiah. Was anybody here alive in 1950? Okay, that's when I came on the scene. Uh, I saw um, uh, the porch, I saw a watermark when it was just a gleam in the eye of a, of a bunch of guys. So this is a special delight from the prayers that went up for you before you were ever here. I wanna show you something because we're about to start Ecclesiastes. Is that right, Josiah? Says you to me, we're gonna start Ecclesiastes. Could you teach something on this? I said, man, I wrote a book on this. It sold dozens of copies over these years. <laughs> Take a look in your Bible at the book of Ecclesiastes or your computer machine or your phone or whatever you have there. And so in Ecclesiastes chapter one, um, in your Old Testament, you've got the history from Genesis to Nehemiah. And then after that, you've got the prophets from Isaiah to Malachi. That's the beginning and end of your Old Testament. And right in the middle, you have what are called the wisdom books, Psalms, Proverbs, um, Song of Solomon, uh, Ecclesiastes, I forgot one, Job. All of those books are kind of the philosophy books. They're called the poetry books because they deal with the heart issues of life what got them in trouble in the history books, what uh, got them prophesied about in the prophets, that of man and sin in this world. And so those five books right in the middle, deal they're kind of philosophy poetry books about the issue of living your life in a world that has fallen. Let me ask you, can you torch your life real quickly by bad decisions? Yes, you can, or you can make it a joy. You can build it on sand, build it on the, on the rock, either way. And so these books talk about the moral decisions. It's almost like they say, um, here's what you should have done in the history so you won't end up like you're gonna be in the prophets if you'd have done this. So you stay with me right here. Ecclesiastes, um, whenever you talk to people that are having a problem with God, the Bible, Christianity, it's usually because of four things. They see a problem between God and reason, the Trinity, the virgin birth, um, the death, burial, resurrection. I can't, that doesn't fit into my grid of what I've experienced. Secondly, they'll have a problem between God and science. Darwin says this, um, this guy says this, uh, Stephen, what's his name? Stephen Hawking, he says this, the Bible says this, I got a problem with God and science. Got a problem with God in the news. Got a problem with God in National Geographic. Who do I believe? And then they'll have a problem with, uh, between uh, Scripture and Scripture. Matthew says this, but Mark says it. Luke says this. John says this. Um, Judges says this. Joshua says this. King says this. Chronicles says this. Whenever you get uh, parallel accounts. They're never going to be identical. They'll be not contradictory, but complementary. And so they'll see those and demand of those, which you would demand of no other works. And so they'll have a problem with what they see as internal inconsistency. And then the other problem is what Ecclesiastes is about. And this is a problem with God and evil. It's called theodicy. Theodike. Dike means judgment. Theo means God. God under judgment. It's when man calls God to the bar of human reason. How many of you have ever had the experience or know somebody that's had it that will not entertain the notion of God because something so painful happened to them that they cannot figure? How could a loving God dot, dot, dot? And it goes like that. How could a loving God let my parents divorce? How could a loving God let my, my brother die of cerebral palsy? How could a loving God allow a Holocaust? How could, and all of us have had things happen in our lives that we wondered where God was. The psalmist reflects it, Proverbs reflects it, Job majored in it. And so yeah, these, uh, Ecclesiastes is about living in a world that is not the best of all possible worlds, but it's on the way to the best of all possible worlds. It's God and evil that we deal with. The first two chapters, the name God is only gonna be mentioned in passing. 
we're going to look at what life is like under the sun. We're not going to look at what God says about it. We're not going to quote in the Old Testament. We're just going to look at life down here under the sun and where we're going to find answers if God does not speak. Uh, it's a very melancholy two chapters. You want to hear it and go throw yourself off a bridge. Okay. <laughs> but hang on. All right. Are you with me so far? God under the sun. How do I coexist in a world that has evil? He begins in verse one, the words of, and it's a, Greek, a Hebrew word called the Koheleth, the preacher. When you think of preacher, you think of the word of God being heralded. He begins very optimistically. I'm going to tell you something that is divine truth, and it's going to carry you through life. Now, I want to assure you what I'm going to teach you here and what Josiah is going to bring you for the next few weeks, you will apply it. Um, a lot of you are going to apply it before you even got here. It's Ecclesiastes. It's the Koheleth, the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. That is Solomon. Solomon is the richest guy that ever lived. He is the most hedonistic guy that ever lived. 700 wives. Are you serious? Um, he is the most intellectual man called the wisest man of his day. So if you have wisdom, you have money, you have pleasure, you would think you've got it all. God's going to take a guy. Francis Schaeffer, the great theologian, uh, apologist said back in my day, he said, God took Solomon, a guy with all the smarts, all the money, all the pleasure, and he propels him to the end of the universe to see what life is like without God. And he comes back and says, if you got wisdom, you got money, you got pleasure, and you don't have God, you've got nothing. You have got vanity, vanity, all is vanity. Be encouraged, okay? <laughs> Verse two. So let's see what Solomon found in his journey. If some guy like me goes out and says, there's no life without God, you're going to say, well, you ain't that smart. You're not that rich. You ain't got that much hedone to enjoy. Solomon can trump every one of us as far as money, wealth, and pleasure. He's had it. If he can't find it, you're not going to find it either. So he says in verse two, vanity of vanities, just like in Israel, you had the holy of holies of all the holiness there was. This was the holy place. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Incidentally, one of the first guys in the Bible is named vanity. Adam and Eve had a kid named Cain. He didn't work out real well. And we had a kid that uh, took his place in the line that would produce Messiah. And his name was Abel. And that's what the word vanity is in Hebrew, Abel because she had a kid named Cain and named him begotten with the help of God. This is the child that maybe is going to be the seed of woman that'll crush the serpent's head. And after he had been around a little while, she named the next kid, you're a loser. That's what it means. All right, Abel, it means vanity. This kid ain't gonna make it on his own. And so in verse three, or rather verse two, he says, Abel, Abel, all is Abel. In verse three, now he's going to explain what vanity means. He doesn't mean that life is meaningless. He means that life is, in verse three, what advantage does man have in all of his work? It's the Hebrew word prophet, P-R-O-F-I-T. What profit? When you die, Josiah, how much are you going to leave behind? Everything. It's all gone. No U-Hauls following a hearse. All right. <laughs> You're going to leave it all. Uh, Mark Twain, an agnostic, he said, when man dies, the world laments him for an hour and forgets him forever. You're gone. It says that at the end of his life, God bestows on him the only untainted gift he ever received, death. Depressive guy, Mark Twain. All right. And so what profit does a man have in all of his work, which he has done? And he uses this term under the sun. It's Solomon's term about life. We're not going to talk about God, the creator, making himself known through his word, whereby I might have new birth. 
That's another sermon for another day. We're talking here about the college scenario, about have y'all discovered that at college they don't play Amazing Grace on the chimes? It's, it's not a Christian place generally. It's a place that is secular. It's man trying to find his answers. And so he says, what profit does a man have under the sun? Life without the Bible, life without God, just a complete secular man. And in verse four, he says, here's what profit you have. A generation goes, they die. A generation comes, the earth remains forever. A guy is born, he goes a number of years, he dies, but the earth keeps on going. The world does not reward you. The world life does not hit a climactic point that you find ultimate joy, peace, and nirvana. You don't uh, explode into space like uh, Steppenwolf said in my day. Anybody? Okay. And so he says a generation's gonna be born, they're gonna die and we're all gonna grieve over you, wipe our eyes, then head off downtown, eat some Tex-Mex, all right? And you're done. Welcome to the porch, okay? He says in verse five, in verse five, verse six, and verse seven are wheels of the cosmos. There's always this tension between man, a sentient being with knowledge and longings, and a cosmos that is nothing more than animals that are hardwired and plants that have life cycles, there's nothing to give us ultimate meaning. And so in verse five, the sun rises, sun sets, hastening to its place, it rises again. Look at it, it's going. The sun is rising and falling and it keeps going. It does not applaud you. Uh, it does not reward you for anything that you do. It just grinds you up. And here in verse six, um, blowing to the south, turning to the north, the wind continues swirling along on its circular courses, the wind returns. So we got the sun, pocket to pocket to pocket to pocket to pocket to pocket, and then we got the wind. Pocket to pocket to pocket to pocket. So we've got these wheels going right here. And then in verse seven, the rivers flow into the sea, yet the sea is not full. To the place where the rivers flow, there they flow again. Why? Because we've got evaporation. The rivers come in, evaporation. Sheep, sheep, sheep. Pocket, 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 pocket. Sheep, sheep. When I've done this in past days, Josiah, I would have three guys stand up here and one of them be this, one of them be this, one of them be this, and it is. It's like a big machine and it's grinding you up. You're gonna hit your physical prowess at 27. How old are you, Josiah? 40, sorry. <laughs> yeah. You're gonna start going down. Can you, can you stuff now? Enjoy, all right? Because you ain't in a little bit. You white, all right. White boys can't jump. That's just the way it is. <laughs> verse eight. In verse eight, we're looking at the machine. And Solomon says, all things are wearisome. You ever hear somebody, the guy that just said the world was a merry-go-round? I want it to stop and let me off. I want to stop and have some kind of meaning and rest. Does the world ever hit a climactic place that it just awards you? It doesn't. You are young, you get older, you hit adolescence, you start going downhill, your kids come out. You get my age where your kids are going through your house going, that's mine. That's mine. How long you gonna live, daddy? Okay. So you're heading down, okay? And so all things are wearisome. Are y'all with me so far? Life is gonna grind you up. When you go back for your first reunion, you're only about 28. Your body's looking pretty good, see. At 38, everybody's getting a little bit humbler, okay? because your marriage is now trying not to tank. About 48, 
you now got kids and you're going to find out why in nature mothers eat their young. All right. <laughs> because them kids are going south on you. All right. I just got back from a uh, uh, reunion, uh, our 50th reunion. Okay. Oh man, man, humility sets in cause everybody looks really bad. All right, <laughs> Lord. And so in verse eight, even though all things are wearisome, what's the next line says? Man is not able to tell it. Man will not back off and say, man in himself, with his reason, with his experience, is not going to find ultimate answers of his origin, his nature and dignity, his moral code, what evil is, redemption is, where history's going. He's not going to find it. Are y'all noticing the word God hasn't been mentioned? And that's for a reason. He's looking at life under the sun. He's not going to mention God here for a while. It's been said that in this book, the name Yahweh for God is not used. The covenant name of Israel is to the word Elohim, the generic name, that it's a book, not just to the Jew. He only mentions one aspect of the law in chapter five, but it's a book that the Gentile can read. Can man find life, meaning and joy without God. Can you do it? When Adam is created, the first thing he sees is a theophany, God making himself known in a human form because Adam corresponds with who God is. God is more human in that sense than we are. We reflect him, we're in his image. He sees God. And in the light of God, God says, this is what the stars are. This is what the ground is. This is why your hand is cool when it rushes because there's something out here and it's called the firmament and it's for you to breathe. And the plants take in the CO2. What's CO2? Don't worry about it, all right? And they're gonna give off oxygen and we're gonna have a little cycle and these are animals, they're not you, but they're hardwired. They're gonna act a certain way. You're gonna have choice. And so before Adam does anything, Adam is a theologian. He knows who God is. And now you can understand life. Now, Adam, do you understand who I am? Yes. Now you can have a wife. What's a wife? Lay down. All right. Out she comes. Adam, this is bone of your bone. Eve, this is the one created first. He's bigger than you, hairier than you. He's going to take care of you. All right. So there's order. And so in the original creation, everybody knows who God is. And now you start living. That's the way it has to work. You've got to know God, then you can have relationships and a job and handle your money and have friends. If you don't have God, you're like an astronaut on a spacewalk. What's the most important bit of, of uh, uniform that he has? It's his tether that holds him to the mother ship. Because when you cut that tether, you are lost in the vacuum. What's the tether that holds you to reality? It's God. So you can be brilliant, wealthy, and everything else. You lose touch with God, and it's going to suck you into the vacuum. And so he's trying to get us reconciled to the infinite, personal God. Our country started that way. We drifted and have only in little periods come back. But that's been the story of man. The story of man is Genesis 1, Revelation 22. Man in the garden, man recreated in a new heaven, a new earth garden. And in between is a footnote to how screwed up this thing has become. But that's the alpha and the omega of your Bible. Man reunited with God. So if you are wealthy, handsome, smart, and all those things, you don't know God, you ain't got a cut dog's chance. And I don't know what that means, <laughs> but you ain't got one. Can I preach your one? <laughs> Keep looking right here. Are you with me so far? All right. And so man isn't able to tell it. Life ought to discourage you at age three, but man will not embrace a system 
that holds him guilty. That's why you can preach any other religion and everybody will respond. They don't hold you guilty. The Bible says, welcome. Your, your deeds of righteousness are filthy rags. And now we get in line to be forgiven and to become morally accountable. And so man cannot figure this out. As a result, the eye is not satisfied with seeing. The ear is, not, is filled with hearing. Man's always looking and listening. Maybe somebody somewhere in some religion can give me something that'll make me have meaning. Man's always in a quest. As a matter of fact, when they kick Cain, no, no, no. Yeah, Cain out of the garden. It said he settled in the land of Nod. That means wanderer. Always looking for something. I was in the 60s. We were trying drugs. We were trying money. We tried communism. We tried, <laughs> you name it. We tried everything we could. We tried success. We couldn't find it. By God's grace, we had a Jesus revolution. People came back. But we could not find any ultimate meaning until a bunch of us found Jesus Christ that brought us back dead sinner to God. Well, he says, man is going to keep looking. That's why in the, about the 15th century, Europe had gone to pot. And so they now start coming West. Maybe over here, we can find the cities of Cibola. Maybe over here, we can find the fountain of youth. Maybe we can find a unicorn or two or a mermaid or something over here that can give us life. Well, we came over here. You know what we found? The same as Europe. We found a bunch of sinners. And so that's why there's always this longing. That's why whenever I was around y'all's age, we had the drug culture. It wasn't for recreation. It was philosophy. If you, the word psychedelic means mind expanding. Maybe in an LSD trip, I can find truth and God out here. But you couldn't. Uh, that's why there's so much of a preoccupation today with UFOs. Man can't fix it. Maybe Saturn can. And so maybe some guy, but they always land at a double wide in West Virginia. Have you ever noticed that? <laughs> I don't know why that is. I can't find, and anyway, I've seen all them UFO movies. When they land, they eat you. All right. <laughs> so you take off running if you see one of them land. Maybe some guy from Venus can fix this. All right. And so maybe science can fix, maybe artificial intelligence, maybe that can, maybe we'll do a revolution every four years and get a new president and he'll lead us on. Maybe we'll elect new guys, they'll lead us on. We're always, man is not able to tell it. We're always clawing and looking. Amen? Amen. Keep watching here. In verse nine, that which has been passed, is that which will be future. That which has been done past is that which will be done. Your attempts have already been tried. You want to find life? Get you a white belt and some bell bottoms. We tried it. Smoke you some dope. We tried it. How about free set? We tried it. You name it. We did it. It's doomed. Be encouraged. <laughs> and so in verse nine, there is nothing, look close at your Bible. What's the word? There is nothing new, nothing novel. Nobody from Venus, nobody from Portland. <laughs> Nobody's gonna find something new. All the philosophies have been tried. We've run the gamut. We're now in existentialism where you don't create God. God doesn't create you. You create God. What do you want truth to be? What's your truth? Find it. That's where we are now. Man now has become God. So he said, there's nothing new. Incidentally, do y'all remember when Paul is at Mars Hill at Athens, all the philosophers gathered daily to talk about anything Anything new. That's why you went to Mars Hill. Is anybody saying anything that hadn't been said? 
Paul started preaching and they called him a name. They said, you're uh, this guy's a spermologus. You ever been called a spermologus? That'll make you fight, my friend. You don't even know what it means. Sperm means a seed. Logos means to speak or to pick. A spermologos is a seed picker. And it means he doesn't say anything new. He's just taking a little eclectic, taking a little something here, a little something here, a little something here, repackaging it, and it's the old stuff. But a bunch of guys listening to Paul said, oh, no, Acts 17. He speaks of strange deities. It's the Greek word heteros, different. He's speaking of a God we've never heard of because he spaketh of Jesus and the resurrection. He's talking about God becoming one of us, dying on a cross, rising from the dead, saving us by faith, returning someday. And so the old philosopher said, oh no, we've never heard nothing like this guy. So man's looking for something new. You must be born again. It's got to be a new birth. Well, in verse 10, is there anything of which somebody might say, see, this is new. It's existed for ages, which were before us. Solomon said, I've been around the block. You can't tell me anything the Egyptians hadn't tried. The Babylonians, the Syrians, all these guys, we've all tried it. In verse 11, man is doomed to repeat his error. There is no remembrance of earlier things or of later things which will occur. There'll be no remembrance among those who come later still. Man is doomed to be confined within the limits of his own reason, his own experience, and his own guilt, that he can't go outside of himself to see who the infinite personal God is. What's the most important verse in your Bible? It's Genesis 1.1. There's a beginning of the creation. God was there, made the heavens, made the earth, made you. We invade upon his existence. The only reason the universe exists is because of him. Once we begin there, we can let this God speak and he can show us who we are, what is our duty, what sin is, how redemption comes, what eternity will look like. Can you dig it? It's the ultimate belief system is Christianity because it deals with eternity. I had a guy say to me in a gym one time, he said, you know, you're a Christian. Don't you know that the nice guys finish last? I said, yeah, but bad guys go to hell. Okay. <laughs> so you got to deal with eternity. All right. I don't know where that conversation went, but uh, <laughs> I'm going to stop right there just a second. Are you with me so far? So you notice he hadn't talked about God. It's talked about man under the sun making life on his own. If you don't know the God of the heavens and the earth that are incarnated himself into creation through his word, died and physically rose and can bring conversion from the outside in, you have not got a chance in this earth. If it could have been found, it would have, and we haven't found it. And so he says, because think about it, Josiah, before you get saved, you got to get lost. He's getting you lost in space. In verse 12 and following, and I'll, I'm, I'm just going to touch on these. He's going to show you the three options that men try without God. First, he's going to try in verse 13, knowledge. I set my mind to seek and explore by wisdom all that's been done under heaven. He's studying history, politics, philosophy, economics. I'm gonna, have y'all ever gone to college with a perennial student that's just always learning? Well, that's what he's trying to do. Uh, it's your freshman year when you're gonna go and learn stuff, hypothetically. <laughs> and he says in verse 13, to do this is a grievous task God has given the Hebrew says, to the sons of Adam, we're fallen. So if you're going to search 
and find through Freud and Nietzsche and Socrates and the Gilgamesh epic and all of these, if you're going to find truth, good luck. Solomon says it's a grievous task to try to do this. He says in verse 14, I've seen all the works which has been done under the sun and behold, it's vanity. We don't find any solutions because what's crooked can't be straightened. Life is immedicably screwed up. Humans are screwed up. The family is screwed up. The government is screwed up. Human religions are screwed up. He says, it's crooked. He goes on and says, what's lacking can't be counted. Everything falls short. Tom Brady, after Super Bowl V, he said, you know, you're never satisfied. I got to do Super Bowl VI, then seven. You're ne you never have enough money. What's lacking can't be counted. And I said, look, I've, I've magnified and increased wisdom more than all who were over Jerusalem before me. My mind has observed a wealth of wisdom and knowledge. He said, if I couldn't find it, you guys aren't going to find it. He says in 17, I set my mind to know wisdom and then madness and folly. I looked at the good guys and I looked at the bad guys and I realized this is striving after wind because in verse 18, in much wisdom, there is much pain In increasing knowledge. There is increasing pain. I see the problems, but I can't fix them. They're unalterably messed up. It's like man had a conversation with the devil or something. Let me bring you back to that. In the Garden of Eden, God says to Adam and Eve, here's the tree of life. You take it like, a, like communion. You fellowship with me. Over here is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, where you will try to know good and evil by yourself. It's the tree of of alienation, or we would say humanism, of man making himself God. Here comes the serpent. He says to the woman, has God said, you shall not eat from any tree? From any tree of the garden, you can eat freely. From the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you don't eat or touch it, lest you die. You shall not surely die. That's a myth, Eve. To try to know good and evil on your own and to make it in life without God, that is not a bad thing. The reason that that's wrong is that God can't be trusted. He's a bad guy. And he knows the day you eat of it, you're going to know good and evil and you won't need him anymore. So, Eve, the worst thing ever happened to you was God who wants to dominate you. You break free and follow, well, me and will be free. Get your motor running way out on the highway, looking for adventure and whatever comes your way. Like a true nature's child, you were born to be wild. Fire all your guns at once and explode into space. Y'all ever hear that when you go to college? You still go to church and read your Bible? Child. You need to grow up and fly, little bird. Let's smoke this, drink that, do this. And you'll find life. God said, in the day you eat of it, you will surely, you're a dead man. We have cut your tether and you're gone. Chapter two, I said to myself, come now, I'll test you with pleasure. So we've tried intellectualism. Let's try hedonism. We're now in our sophomore year. <laughs> We're going to pledge Kappa Alouetta over here. Okay. <laughs> he said, I'll test you with pleasure. I love the next phrase. Enjoy yourself like a commercial. Go for the high life. And I said of laughter, I said it was futility. I said of laughter, it's crazy. I remember in my pagan days, I went to the University of North Texas. Did you tell them I was one of the great quarterbacks in the history of college football? <laughs> Led my team to seven wins in four years that I was at North <laughs> Texas State. 
Ever so often, we'd come down to Dallas and just get wasted. We'd go to a place called the Lemon Tree Lounge. And, you know, there's all kind of stuff. There's women, there's men, there's booze, there's music. That ain't a good mix right there. And they're playing all this music. And I remember looking over in the bar mirror and seeing myself. All right. <laughs> and I just looked at myself and everybody else and I said, this is a bad deal right here. Somebody's going to get shot. <laughs> I just looked at it and I said, every time Josiah, I read that verse two, that's me at the lemon tree lounge. This is madness. What does it accomplish? I explored with my mind how to stimulate my body with wine while my mind was guiding me wisely. That means I got drunk and took notes. <laughs> Are we having fun? No. <laughs> to see what good there is. So we've tried intellectualism. We tried hedonism. How much drinking do you have to do? How much sex do you need to have? After a while, it's just old stuff. So he says it didn't work. So now we go to our junior year. Verse four, we're gonna try materialism. We'll make a billion dollars and move to Dallas, okay? And so I enlarged my works and built houses for myself, vineyards for myself, parks for myself. Verse six, water for myself. All the way down to where else? Let's see. Verse eight, collected from a self, silver and gold, the treasure of kings and many concubines. So I made all the money, all the pleasure and all the learning I could have. And verse nine, I became great and increased more. I was the greatest. Verse 10, all my eyes desired, I didn't refuse. My hands in verse 11, he says in verse 10, I didn't withhold my heart from any pleasure. My heart was pleased because of my labor. What that means, Josiah, is I did have pleasure clearing the land, building a park, building a house, planting vineyards. He said that was fun. It is fun to be like God and with opposable thumbs and radiuses and balls and socket, we can do all kinds of things and we can make things. That's fun. Remember when you were a little boy, they give you a Christmas present, throw the present away and play with the box. You remember that? because you like creating. So Solomon says, it's great to create, but ultimately he says, there's no profit in them. He says in verse 12 and following, I've learned that it's better to be wise than an idiot. But in verse 14, one fate befalls them all. What's the one fate that befalls wise men and idiots alike? Death. Death. I don't care who you are. You're going to die. And then you're going to leave it to your kids. God help you. And they're going to put it on the curb because they want a jet ski. All right. So they're going to sell all your precious stuff to get a, a, a tent when they travel. And so in verse 17, we've tried them all. Here's the conclusion. Verse 17, read that Josiah out loud. I hated life. Verse 18, read that, Josiah. I hated all the toil. I hated my work. Verse 20, Josiah. I turned around or turned about and gave my heart up to despair. I despaired. You see what the results was? I hated life. I hated all the work that I'd done and I am despairing. Francis Schaeffer said, he's now suicidal. And Solomon says, I've been there. You're never gonna have the pleasure I had. You're never gonna have the money. You're never gonna have the knowledge. And I'm telling you right now, once you get through building and having fun, it goes into the ground, you die, and it's done. Grass covers you up. He said, man without God is suicidal. Solomon. And so in verse 24, and we conclude, 
He hasn't mentioned God, but once in passing, now he's going to give you a solution. Would y'all agree that he has shown you the problem? That's the mark of a good Koheleth. You show the problem and you show the solution. And so he says, look, now there's two interpretations to this, two translations that get to the same place. I'm going to give them both to you. One is there is nothing better for a man than to simply enjoy life, eat and drink. Your labor is good. Enjoy your food, enjoy your company, enjoy your labor because it's from the hand of, what's the last word? God. Solomon says in verse 25, who can eat and drink and have enjoyment without him? He stops and he says, readers, you cannot enjoy life without God. In other words, he ends this text with the Westminster Confession. The chief end of man is to know God and to glorify him forever. Incidentally, the book is going to end the same way. When all has been said, fear God, keep his commandments, this is the whole of man. We're going to end the book with the Westminster Confession, with Adam in the garden. Without God, well, what Francis Schaeffer say? When there is no absolute by which to judge society, society is absolute. You're going to discover through history, take it from an old man, man makes for a bad deity. He's not a good God. Man will screw it up every time. And so that's one interpretation is that you cannot enjoy life without God. You better get him straight. Whenever you have kids, I have two of them, Terminator and Rambo, okay? <laughs> My two boys. And I raised them as good as I could, but when they were four years old, they put their trust in Christ. With me and my wife, they prayed. One is a detective in Fort Worth. The other's in the Secret Service. They put on Kevlar and shoot people. All right, that's their job. But they know God, they'll shoot you well to the glory of God if they have to. <laughs> they love their wives, they love their kids. So my boys are good boys. Now that you know God, do you know where you came from? Yeah. You know who you are? Yeah. You know where evil's from? Yeah. You know how it's taken away? Yeah. You know what your duty is? Yeah. You know where the universe is going? Yeah. You're cool. You're set right there. Now just fill in the gaps and learn stuff and enjoy life. So he says, without God, you're not going to make it. The other interpretation is by a guy named Walt Kaiser, best Hebrew guy I've ever known. His interpretation is in verse 24, the word better should not be there. He said the word better shows up throughout the book of Ecclesiastes. It's nothing better for a man than to do this. He said in the Hebrew, the word better right here is not there. That's why some of you have better in italics. It's added by the interpreter. And so he feels that it should say, there is nothing in a man to eat and drink and tell himself his labor is good. This I have seen is from the hand of God. He says that this is the greatest philosophical statement in the Bible. There is nothing within finite man to be an infinite by which he will understand life, enjoyment, and his labor and then God. If you don't know God, you cannot, verse 25, eat and drink and have joy. It's always going to be depressing. It's always going to be anxiety. You've got to know God. I like that second interpretation. I believe he says, there is nothing for a human being to eat and drink and enjoy and tell himself his labor is good. It's from the hand of God. Who can eat and who can have enjoyment without him? Without God, you're not going to make it. In verse 26, and incidentally, Josiah, that's the first laborious time he uses the term God. He showed you without God, you're a dead man walking. With God, you're going to make it. In verse 26, to a person good in his sight, he's given wisdom, divine wisdom, divine knowledge, and just thus joy. The sinner, he's given the task of gathering and collecting that God can give it to the one who is good in his sight, that God can save you and then God can guide your life. Without God, you're a dung beetle. You ever seen a dung beetle? 
A dung beetle just collects his own crap and takes it into the house. That's man without God. You're just a dung beetle, all right? Great title for this sermon, you know. <laughs> and so, there is the end of the book. When I was in college, I went to college. Nobody in my family had ever been to college. I went to college on a scholarship at North Texas, and I went through intellectualism, hedonism, materialism, and I reached the end of my tether. And I did not know what I was going to do. And I ran into one day a campus crusader, came to my room in 1972. And he said to me, I'm taking a survey. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hurry up. And I'm trying to get out of the room. So I got out of the room. I went up to the uh, elevator. Can I ask you while we're standing at the elevator? Yeah, sure. Bug, 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 bug. Go ahead. What do you call yourself? Christian, Muslim, Hindu, what? I said, I'm, I'm a Christian. I was raised Methodist in Waco. I said, I'm a, I'm a Christian. And he said, uh, what do you think a Christian is? What a rude question. <laughs> he said, what do you think a Christian is? And I said, it's somebody that keeps the Ten Commandments. And he just looked at me and he said, you think that's a Christian? Like I could be wrong. I was a quarterback. <laughs> and, uh, he said, you think that's a Christian? And I said, yeah. And about that time, the elevator goes, ding, going down. And so he just kind of left me going to hell and didn't tell me. So I just, yeah. A couple of weeks later, I picked up a magazine called Athletes in Action. They had a testimony in there of a guy named Terry Pape, linebacker from Stanford. I read his testimony so many times. I knew the answer was in there, but I couldn't understand it. He talked about being lonely, aloof, no meaning to life, took long walks at night, reaching inside of himself, couldn't find anything, heard the fact that God had made himself known. His son was the central point of his word who became one of us and died. I mean, Jesus went to the nerve center of the problem. I'll be a man and I'll die for what you did and rise for what you didn't and we can do an exchange. And he said, I heard that. And I said, Jesus, I've tried for 22 years and I failed to come into my life and save me. The guy's name was Terry Pape. I read it so many times that I memorized what he had said. I ran into the guy at Dallas Seminary in the library and I said, hey, you don't know me, but you helped get me saved. And so I, I read that testimony, but it didn't do anything. A short while later, I go into my room. I've got this roommate that's 6'7", about 270 from Houston, Cypress Fairbanks. There's a little guy that's about 2'1", okay? <laughs> and he's talking to him. And I looked at him and I sat on my bed and my roommate said, this guy's name's Jerry. And he's talking to me about God. And I'm thinking, you let him in? <laughs> yeah, because he was just going door to door. Hello, I'm Jerry Cook. I'd like to tell you about the person of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Thank you. Hi, I'm Jerry Cook. And for some reason, my roommate let him in. And I don't know why I did, because Cartoon Carnival's on. And that means he had to turn it off. All right. My roommate didn't miss Cartoon Carnival. Okay. And so he's sitting in there, and Jerry's talking to him. And I listened over his shoulder. He's not even looking at me. And he says to my roommate, what are you? Are you a Jew? You a Christian? You a Hindu? You a Muslim? What are you? Same as the guy asked me. My roommate says, I'm a Christian. And he says, what is a Christian? Deja vu. This is happening again. He says, what is a Christian? And my roommate says, it's somebody that keeps the Ten Commandments. <laughs> and I'm like mouthing the word. <laughs> now I got the answer. And he looks at my roommate and he could have said a number of things. Am I going too long here, Josiah? Am I okay? We got people going to hell and I'd like to tell them how not to go. <laughs> <laughs> Where was that? <laughs> he says to me, he could have said to my roommate, uh, name him, and we'd have been in trouble. <laughs> or he could have said, find him, all right, we'd have really been in trouble. All he said was this, and by this time, I'm not reading my book. 
I'm listening because I'm thinking the hound of heaven, somebody's after me. Because I knew it wasn't Rex. I knew he was going to hell. All right. So I, <laughs> I didn't even count that. Either. This guy says, he just looks at my roommate and he says, you keep them. You keep them. My roommate was silent. Habakkuk 2, the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silent. God has shut up all in disobedience. My roommate couldn't say a word, and I couldn't either. And then this guy just ground the knife in. He said, when I say keep them, I don't mean just mean the peaks. I mean the valleys. You hadn't just murdered anybody. You've never called anybody a name. You're not just an adulterer. You've never looked at a woman with lust. You're not just you know, a, a bad kid. You've never, ever disobeyed your parents. You've never lied. You've never coveted anything ahead of God Almighty. You've sought him with all your heart. My roommate was silent and I was silent and I was just looking at his back. And then he said to my roommate words that all of the universe opened right here. He said to my roommate, God didn't give the Ten Commandments primarily for us to keep. He gave them as boundaries, but primarily he gave them to show us his nature and that we could not keep them, that we are guilty. And he said to my roommate, that's why the Bible doesn't end with the Ten Commandments. It goes on to people that broke them and then his son came to die that he lived perfectly under the law. He died to the punishment of the law and he rose from the dead. So our victory was won by him and by receiving him. He said, it's not just enough to know this. You have to receive him into your heart and you personally with God have got to have an encounter. You and God have got to have an encounter and you've got to either accept this gift or reject him. And if you accept him, He's going to turn your life upside down and you're going to have to explain it and stand before the world with that knowledge. And, when, and then he left. My roommate became a bouncer in a Houston topless bar. <laughs> he was a defensive end. Okay. It hit me and I went out of there and I thought, if that's not true, it ought to be because I found nothing like that. And I, make a long story short, God brought me to the end of my rope and I got home. I knelt by that bed, locked the door and got on my knees. And I said, God, I have tried for 22 years to find meaning and I can't find it. I've never, cause I can never remember Josiah ever in my life repenting. I can never re re remember feeling guilty before a holy God. I, I felt bad. I got caught sometimes. My conscience would bother me. But I never, ever before a holy God said, I am in a heap of trouble and I need you to save me. I would pray when we were going to play Arkansas. Okay, our Father who art in heaven. All right. But that's all. And I died. I didn't know I got heaven out of the deal. I just wanted to die and give my life to somebody else. The next morning, something was changed. I was like a baby that had come out of the womb. Everything looked different. I opened the Bible. It made sense. Shortly after that, I tore up my knee, missed my senior year. They brought in a coach named Hayden Fry. Anybody? College Hall of Fame. And I thought, this is why God let my knee get injured, so I can play my fifth year and be Heisman Trophy winner. God is good. And Hayden Fry called me into his office. He said, Tommy, you're a fifth year senior. Yes, sir, I am. Why do you want to come back your fifth year? Well, frankly, I want to play for guys like you. He said, well, we are flattered. However, <laughs> we're going to lose this year. And I can't lose with a fifth year senior. And so Tommy, arrivederci, chili con carne, <laughs> ciao, bye-bye. <laughs> And I got cut. Shortly thereafter, I started working at Louisville High School, getting my student teaching in. This guy comes to me and says, hey, you're a Christian? Yeah, I was a coach. Could you come talk to my FCA group? 16 kids. I got up. I had it written down, what I was going to say. It was called God's plan. 
And so I said, hey, it's good to be here talking to y'all. And I talked about God's love, man, sin, Christ's death. When I finished, I said, I don't guess any of y'all want to be Christians. Eight of them said we did. Later on, they said, could you speak to the school? And I said, God, you'll be sorry. <laughs> I was Barney Fife with one bullet. All right. I'll do it. And God got me up there and I shared my faith and the place went silent and God blessed his word. And I found out you could get paid for this. And here I am. <laughs> my point is, God has something. He broke me up with my girlfriend, dated her four years. There was somebody, she much better off now, but God brought me to the woman he wanted me to have, the kids, and he has led me all the way. So if you died right now, stood before God, and he said, why should I let you in my heaven? What would you answer? If your answer is anything other than Jesus, you better stop because before you can go on to anything, you've got to settle this issue of you, God, and eternity. What's it going to be? You still get salvation the way Adam did. You eat from the tree. They're across the runner. That's the tree. You go to it and you receive Christ. He that opens the door, I'll come in and I'll sup with him and him with me. Father in heaven, I thank you for this book and it has laid the foundation right here. Man without God is in the desert and money and pleasure and uh, uh, intelligence is not going to satisfy us. That there is nothing in a man to enjoy life and say his labor is good. This is from the hand of God. Adam must know God before he knows anything else. And these young men and women, I have been where they are. I've sat in these chairs and there's a whole lot of messages going out around them. And none of them are about the infinite personal God. They are all applauding the next generations, discovering something that man has not found since Adam. And that is eternal life. May this very night you have a come to Jesus meeting in the heart of these young studs, and you would guide them all of their lives into the blessedness of knowing God, in whose name we pray, amen. <laughs>